Hi there and welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics with me, Adrian Goldberg. I'm an investigative journalist, West Bromwich Albion season ticket holder, joined as usual by Charlton Athletics Chief Executive Charlie Methven. Charlie wants a director of Sunderland, a boyhood Oxford United fan, has also given professional advice to both Arsenal and Spurs and this time... Well, a bit of a, a treat, really. We're taking you inside Soccer X. Soccer X is a twice a year conference and networking event for global football's movers and shakers. The latest was in Miami. Charlie, of course, being a mover and shaker, was there. I, of course, not being a mover and shaker, wasn't. So, uh, Charlie, tell me who was there and what kind of things get discussed by Soccer X. It's it's kind of um it's a private event, is it? It's not like FIFA or UEFA. It's an independent event, but lots of the great and good do gather to chew over big topics about the future of football, as I understand it. Yeah, that's right, Adrian. Um, but basically, the event breaks down into two parts. You've got the the expo bit of it, which is where all sort of exhibitors can demonstrate the latest technology and, and gadgets and all the different types of things that football clubs and football organizations might want to buy. And then the other part of it, which is the conference, is um, as a conventional conference would be as a series of um, debates and panel shows and speaker events and um, networking events, which is about chief executives, owners, chief commercial officers, finance directors from around the world of football getting together um, and sharing experiences and questions about what's happening at the moment, what might be happening over the next six months to a year. It's deliberately um, positioned um, in, in the international break so that clubs, people running clubs, have got the ability to, um, to attend without missing um, home matches. Um, and it's, it's basically quite a quiet time of year when you are somebody running a club because you've got the, the summer, which is absolute mayhem, not only the transfer window, but that's when you do all your capex on the stadium. You're selling your season tickets, you're selling your commercial sponsorships for the season and all this type of stuff. I think I managed to get three days away in the entirety of the summer. Then the season starts and the first few matches, you're looking at what's, what's working and what's not working. What's, you know, what do we need to tweak? What do we need to do? And actually, of course, you're still in the transfer window as well. Um, and then when you come into the autumn, and you have these international breaks in quick succession and the season's more or less up and running. There's very little, obviously, you can do to the squad. There's very little you can do to the stadium at that point. That's the time when perhaps, you know, executives can take a, a bit of time off or um, come to conferences like this and start to think about, OK, well, what would we be doing next year? What kind of capex might we look at for next summer? What sort of strategies can we put in place that's worked somewhere else in the world that we haven't tried yet? And that's really the point of this of this conference. Yeah, capex being capital expenditure for those of us who uh, who are not experts in this world, Charlie. So, what are the big trends coming out of Soccer X? And are there any big names there, either on the the admin side of football or any big star former players or current players there? Um, the, the sort of <laughs> being the suits, <clears throat> you would hardly describe most of the people there as um, as celebrities. Um, on, on one panel which I sat on, there was the chief executive of Botafogo, who are leading the Brazilian league, who are very, very smart guy. Um, the, very happy to bump into one of my old um, friends and colleagues, Mark Ashton, the chief executive of Ipswich Town, who was speaking um, at another event. Um, West, the, West uh, Bromwich City. Albion, West Bromwich Albion connection as well. Mark Ashton was at the back. He's on his yep. way yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Baggy, West Brom's his club, really. Um, yeah. And speaking of other people, West Brom is their club. I was delighted to spend some time with the West Brom owner, Shalem Patel, oh. um, who uh, m must be one of the smartest owners I've met in the industry. You, you've, you've got a good one there. I can't obviously go into too much of what we discussed um, for obvious reasons. It was a private conversation, but he was an extremely smart, strategic guy. Um, and I'm sort of happy on your behalf that the next <laughs> few years of West Brom look to have, have slightly calmer, more sort of progressive waters ahead of them than, than has been the case over the last five years. Um, and then all sorts of people from, you know, uh, world governing bodies, obviously a lot from American soccer, um, because it's, it's being held in Miami. So the first, the sort of pre-conference um, was held at Inter Miami's stadium. Um, and we had a very interesting couple of hours with um, Inter Miami's technical director on the particularities of dealing with a, a side that has Lionel Messi in it, um, which was 
really interesting from a sort of purely practical standpoint. How do you deal with having the world's greatest player in your midst? Um, so there are all sorts of um, things, people, um, you know, who, who are there. Um, and probably quite a heavy preponderance of sort of top people from Latin American football, because it being in Miami, that's very much in their sort of hemisphere. Um, and quite a number of uh, sort of executives from La Liga um, uh, who are sponsoring um, part of the conference. Um, I'd say the Premier League typically is quite underrepresented at these conferences, Premier League clubs. I say Mark was there, but Mark is Mark Ashton is very much one of the most sort of forward thinking people in the game and always wants to know what's going on. Um, but yeah, an, aw an awful lot of different people from around the world. The topics, the topics um, under discussion, there was probably, you know, getting on for half the conference was discussing, you know, digitization, data and tech in some way, shape or form. A good chunk of that was to do obviously with um, performance, i.e. the playing side of things and how data is utilized in recruitment and in performance management. There was a lot of um, sessions on, on how to use data to optimize how training is done, broadly speaking, training and coaching and all that type of stuff, but a bit away from my um, specialist areas. The bits that were particular to me were how you use um, sort of digitization technology to improve <clears throat> fan experience, whether it be in the stadium or, um, or remotely, dig digitally, effectively. Um, there was a lot about the future of football in the US, um, obviously got a World Cup coming up there and in the not too distant future because people forget the Qatar World Cup was effectively held six months late um, and that was already a couple of years ago so you know you're looking at, at, at the next World Cup really being in the in sort of coming up in the in the headlights quite soon 2026 um, and uh, obviously being in Miami there was quite a bit about into Miami and about well what What's this, what does a post-Messi world look like for Inter Miami, but also for the MLS as a whole and the shape of the US leagues? Um, there was a lot about cost controls, um, which wouldn't surprise any listeners to this pod um, when you get football club chief executives in a room together. One of the biggest subjects under discussion is how to operate the best cost control um, structures, which we discussed before. There was a fair bit about the age profiling of football spectators or consumers in different ways. Um, <clears throat> FIFA governance in general. Um, there was some interesting questions sort of in, in the in the margins of the conference around whether Infantino is going to stand for another term in a year or so's time or not. And if not, then what does that look like? Um, and then as, as president of amount. FIFA, as president of FIFA, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, tell me, tell me, uh, exactly. we, we won't get through all of these, Charlie, but I mean, for example, when you talk about digitisation, that can sound very theoretical. Here I am, a season ticket holder at West Bromwich Albion, nine-year-old daughter who comes with me. How does digitisation help my club or uh, any chief executive at any club improve my supporter experience, for want of a better word? So I, th I, think, I think amongst the things that you might be looking for, at in the next two or three years, one of which would be face recognition technology, which means that as a regular fan, whether you're entering the ground or whether you're going to buy something at half time or whether you're going to the shop, there'll be the technology in, in place to, 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 without you having to fish in your po pockets for stuff and all this type of stuff, simply for, for, the, for the technology to recognize that's Adrian Goldberg and for you to be able to effectively pay um, through your wallet, um, having been identified as being Adrian Goldberg. And that was something which already now being used in Latin America. Um, and, the, and the chief executive of Botafogo was talking me through all the various different ups and downs of that. But basically, it's been a big up. And the biggest thing it's done is it's cut queuing time. It's cut queuing time in, 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 in the concourses at half time and before the game and, and in the retail area, etc. It's really helped in that regard. He did mention that one of the things that they've got there is that they also link it up to the local um, police database. So that if anyone's wanted for crime, they can get done. And I said, that, that, that sounds a bit that sounds a bit big brothery for me. Um, and in certain English football stadia, might lead to quite empty stadiums. So I think <laughs> we'd probably not take it quite that far. <laughs> but, um, uh, so yeah, oh, so but face Charlie, rest Charlie, what about all the, you know, a serious point here, isn't it? You know, it, it, like West Brom, you and I have spoken before about how football clubs work towards 
diversity and that's I think we both agree that socially that's very important that football clubs do that but if you look at the profile of spectators both at the Hawthorns and at the Valley and I suspect at most most other football grounds they don't look like the community immediately living around those stadia certainly not at the Hawthorns and certainly not around the Valley but one of the areas where there is much greater diversity is the kids serving behind the counters, probably earning their minimum wage, serving your pies and your your Pepsis. Does that mean the end of, of those kind of job opportunities then, if you have this kind of facial recognition and the end of queuing, sort of reduction in queuing? No, no, it, no, it, it, no it just means that, that their job gets made um, easier um, in terms of taking payment. It just means that they can process more people. Um, diversity is a, you know, another big issue. Um, not something that the Latin American clubs are particularly concerned by, but certainly the European clubs are. And it's something that at Charleston will be announcing something sort of fairly major in the in, in coming weeks on, on this topic. Because as you say, um, if you are serious about building the business of the future, just as it always has been the case, football clubs do have to represent their local community. They always did. They always did. You know, th th this is sort of, this is not some sort of new thing. It's just that the nature of the community has changed. But if you stop representing your community, then ultimately you, you, you end up in a in, in a difficult place, I think. And that's, you know, cert certainly a topic that, um, that, that the West Brom owner, owner and I discussed. Um, it's uh, perhaps a little bit a little bit more challenging in, in, in the West Brom example with uh, such a preponderance of the, the locality there being from a diverse background for whom cricket is the is, is the major sport. Um, whereas at the Valley, um, our local communities are um, Nigerian and Jamaican, or West African and Jamaican, for which football is the major sport. Um, but it was interesting because one of the questions I asked the face recognition technology people is, you know, might this be interesting as a tool to help us measure um, diversity? Because it's actually not that straightforward a thing to measure directly, unless you've got somebody on the turnstiles counting people in and counting people out. Um, it's sometimes straightforward in terms of, let's say if somebody comes from a Nigerian background, their surname will indicate diversity often. But if they're from a West Indian background, it won't. That, that, that They'll sound like they have a Scottish name, you know, and that's, that's you, you can't tell just from looking at your season ticket base how many people you do have from diverse backgrounds. So that's one thing I was discussing with the, the face recognition technology people. Um, probably another area which is going to, you know, make its way to English football stadia and is already doing so in parts of the world, that comes effectively from US sport is the ability to get served to your seat. Um, so rather than having to get up, go to a kiosk, queue up, et cetera, is be able to effectively order food and drink on the app during the first half, which then means that in the last five or 10 minutes of the first half, there is food and drink being delivered to you. Obvious challenges with those who are sitting in the middle of a row, um, which we were discussing, the practicalities of all that. Um, the ability to um, order on the minute retail. So let's say, for example, that, you know, West Brom get a, a, a winner in the second half. How quickly can you get a T-shirt turned around with that goal scorer on a T-shirt and how quickly can fans order that for collection after the game? So all of these types of things are the type, are sort of, you know, the subject of very detailed discussions because very often you'll find that there is a, you know, pilot scheme or something happening somewhere in the world and they can tell you whether it does or doesn't work. Because, you know, when you're the chief executive of a football club, you're constantly being pitched stuff all the time. But really what you want is to speak to somebody who's already implemented it and had to deal with all the teething issues and all the problems that come thereof. So that was definitely a large sort of chunk of my time was really looking at the, the stadium technology side. Yeah. I'm interested in uh, the difference as well that you've pointed out between the age profile of supporters in Europe relative to the rest of the world. So a lot of supporters in Europe look like you and I. Too few look like my daughter, I gather, but that's not the case. That's a that's not the case elsewhere in the world. That is a, a European problem of a kind of an aging profile of the football supporter fan base. Um yes, um it is that that that, that is true. Um so if you look at North America where effectively football soccer as they would call it is the is the is the young growing sport and baseball for instance is the older gradually dying sport so the age profile of the US market is much much younger for football soccer than it is for all of their historic sports um 
Latin America, for some reason, doesn't seem to have the same aging profiles that we do. Um, it seems to still attract a, a pretty vibrant young, young market. Um, but in Europe, which is obviously the most mature football spectator market, um, there, there are these issues and questions with a gradual aging profile of in-stadium spect spectators. That's not true of people who consume football content more broadly. So if you were to look at a football YouTuber channel, that might have, as we've discussed before, hundreds of thousands, millions even of viewers, and the age profile of them will be very, very low. But the conversion of them into in-stadium spectators is challenging. I, I mean, you've got to imagine that price has got something to do with this. It's got, it's got. I mean, it has, hasn't it? Clearly, Charlie. I mean, to be fair, at West Brom now, there is a, a child season ticket which effectively costs a pound a game, twenty-three pounds yeah. per season if the child is taken with an adult, which you know, of course, is a fantastic offer, and it's only a, it's only a fiver on a per match basis for a child, but this follows years. And I don't want to make this about West Brom in particular, but if you look at the pricing structure, I'd say specifically of Premier League football, but also then by extension, the championship whereby clubs are attempting to try and keep up financially with the Premier League, even though it's inevitably a losing battle because of the, the vast inequalities of wealth. But when you're talking maybe 33 34 pounds even to watch a championship match for an adult if you're then even at half price trying to get a kid in for that in many economically challenged parts of the country you can see why a lot of young people aren't being taken to football or can't afford themselves to to take themselves to football because it is just too expensive i would say that most clubs now, for some considerable time, have made a significant effort to make it affordable to take a child to a football match. The challenging age demographic is 16 to 30. When somebody becomes <clears throat> responsible for their own expenditure and when they come out of the junior bracket in terms of the very discounted tickets and move into a world where they're starting to earn but not earning very much, and they're also starting to have different competing pressures on the amount of disposable income that they do have. Um, we've attempted to address that starting this season with a, a, a stand or an area of a stand, a corner effectively, which is devoted to 16 to 21-year-olds um, with heavily discounted tickets to try to start to translate people through from the moment at which they leave the embrace of their family through to the point at which they're earning enough to be able to you know, pay their own way. And that's starting to have some success. That's starting to pick up, et cetera. But this, the, these things are all slow burns, just as I think it was a slow burn that, it, that clubs didn't get their head around this in the 2000s, really, is when it happens, when prices really started to escalate and they didn't give enough thought to pricing structures and future generations and cohorts and all that type of stuff. So I think that the changes that have been made in the last five, five years will take a while to you know, to have effect. But also we have to, you know, sort of recognize the reality that we're dealing with a generation that is used to living more digitally rather than in, in real terms. I mean, you know, when you and I were growing up, there was no digital option. Um, you know, you aged 18, you either went to the football or you didn't go to the football. It wasn't sort of anything in between. Um, and if you didn't go to the football, then that was it. You didn't have any football to watch. It was as simple as that. Whereas now, that's not really the case. I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of live football being shown, but also a lot of digital football content. Um, and it's interesting, one of the other topics that came up during the conference was the extent to which, amongst those younger generations, highlights are more valuable than full live games. Um, they're used to short-form content. So effectively, whereas historically, the large amount of money has been paid for the live game, the full live game, and actually highlights have often been thrown away as a bit of a sort of financial irrelevance. We're looking towards a future where the highlights deals and packages become worth a lot more, I think. I've seen suggestions, and I don't know if this was raised at Soccer X, even that the that might encourage the games administrators to tinker with the structure of the game. We've heard previously about the idea of uh, four quarters for football, trying to make the game more palatable to a generation who are used to shorter form content. Obviously, to traditionalists like myself, that would be an absolute outrage. But if 
the people who are in charge of football are looking at where the audience is and where the, the next generation of audience is, maybe that's something they're going to have to consider. No, I don't think so. Um, and in fact, <laughs> I, think the, I think the general tone of the conference was even those things that have supposedly been done to try to modernise um, have not necessarily been successful. There was, there was certainly a very anti-VAR sentiment running through the conference, um, which was interesting. And that was multi-geographical from different continents. Because I think the, the recognition is, is that if you are going to engage with people, the ball has to spend as much time in play as possible. This is something that football has against American football or baseball or cricket or whatever it might be, is that it's a continuous flow of a game without all the stops that happen in other sports and that we're in danger of losing one of our key competitive differentiators, which is ball in playtime, basically. Um, and so, so that, that, that was definitely discussed. So I, no, I, I don't think there was any sense. I mean, look, you know, we're, we're talking about um, challenges, cohort and demographic challenges within a prism where the sport globally is growing. Um, and in fact, the sport even domestically is growing, frankly. Um, in the UK, attendances are rising. <laughs> So, you know, it's it, it's not like other sports that are really having to confront this in a very serious way. Um, you know, if you look at something like golf, for instance, golf viewership is down. The average age of participants is up. You know, they've got sort of significant challenges. Um, I, I don't think that's the case with football. It's, it's more a question of if we want to keep on growing, then what, what, what are the steps that we need to take now? And there's certainly no sense at all that football is in a place where it needs to start tinkering with the format. I have to say I'm delighted to hear that, by the way. That's that's good. That's good because you know, it's a great product. It's a great game. And that's not to say that things can't be improved about it because you know, that's partly why we do this podcast. But the fundamental product is good. Uh, talk to me a bit more about the United States because I think what's happening in the US, both in men's and women's football, seems to me at one level to be potentially a giant step forward. But what you know, what happens, for example, when Messi leaves into Miami? Are people going to see him? Are they then welded to the club for life? Maybe we won't know for a few years. So I think, look, the, the, go, up, go up into space and look down on the world. And what you'll see over the last 10 years is an absolute explosion of measurable interest in football or soccer in the US, both in the women's game and the men's game. So you've seen the establishment of a professional women's soccer league, the NWSL, which is about 10 years ago, which is now an established, successful um, women's league, the, the, the first such in the world. They, they have average attendances, I think 11 or 12,000 per game. Um, and that's, you know, I know that we, we look at that in the prism of men's professional football in this country, but if you look at it more generally in terms of sport in general, that is then broadly comparable with significant professional sports leagues elsewhere in the world. If you're getting 12,000 a game, paying customers, because that, that, that's a paying attendance number, um, that's very, very significant. The MLS during that time over the last 10 years has definitely taken steps forward. Um, now, you know, is it yet, would it ever be everything that its founders and maybe current franchise holders dreamt of? I'm not sure for various different reasons, or at least it might take quite a lot longer than was originally envisaged. But there's no doubt that it is a much more significant league in global terms than it was 10 years ago. But probably the biggest single metric which has exploded is the amount of American TV viewers who view European football and particularly English football. That has absolutely exploded. Hundreds of percentages up from where it was 10 years ago. So Football, soccer, has finally cracked the US market. There's no doubt about it. That it, it is absolutely now up there with the big US sports for consideration when a, a big sports conference is, you're talking about, well, what, what sports matter in the US? Soccer is now in that, in that conversation. It's part of that conversation. Now, if you look at the MLS specifically, um, the messy play has been successful. Right. In that, the amount that they've had to pay him has been outweighed by the amount of revenue that having him has brought and by the amount of extra interest that has been brought onto the league, both domestically and internationally. So as a strategic move, it, it worked. You've got to assume that Messi will retire 
in the relatively near future, given the age profile, et cetera. So let's just say that he does another season beyond this season and that beyond that, it's it's not likely that he's going to keep on going and going and going. So question number one is, is what's what happens to the MLS post-Messi? Are they going to carry on down that track of trying to attract the odd, really big name to the league? Bear in mind that in the, in the MLS, contracts are held at league level. So Lionel, Lionel Messi is contracted to the league, not into Miami. He's con- his contract is with the league, who then effectively subcontract it to Inter Miami, right? So is the MLS itself going to decide to try to bring one or two major stars on a rolling basis to try and keep that interest level high? The problem is those major stars simply will not be as famous as Messi. So will they have the same impact? Probably not, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, is the impact on Inter Miami itself. And it was quite interesting, as I said, that the, the, con- the pre-conference that happened on, on Monday was held at their, their current stadium, which is a bit of a sort of put up, sort of, you know, pop-up stadium, I would say almost. It's, it's about 20,000 seats. Um, and what was interesting is that last season, in his first season there, they were packed out every game, even at very high ticket prices. This season, they have not quite been packed out. They've, they've, they've done well. They have not quite been packed out, which which sort of rather leads me to think that probably quite a few of the people attending last year wanted to see Messi play once, but did they need to see him play a second, third, and fourth time? Maybe. Um, they're moving to a very expensive, much bigger stadium in central Miami, the current stadium's in Fort Lauderdale, um, in, in the next couple of years. And it will be interesting to see if that, drives a higher attendance because if, if at the moment they're not quite filling out a 20,000 seat stadium to move to a you know much bigger stadium is, is is a big play you know a big bet a big gamble and it's really the case I think that if anyone can make all this kind of stuff work it is Miami because of the very high preponderance of Latin American um, people in the city who bring their football devotion with them and who care about the game, who are used to paying to watch the game, who are able to generate that level of enthusiasm about the game. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see the next two or three years at Inter Miami, but also MLS level. The big challenge that they have is that the general American sports and soccer, or so, I, I use the word soccer not because I use the word soccer, but because if you say football in America, it's it's assumed to mean NFL. So the, the average soccer devotee in North America is really more devoted to paying to watch European football. And that's the truth. That's the truth of the matter. So they, it happens at a very convenient time of day for them. They, they get up in the morning and they have what they call soccer brunches, where a group of them get together, have brunch and watch often two or three um, top flight uh, matches, normally English. Um, and they almost watch them almost back to back like that and that's driving a huge huge level of interest over here and a huge viewership um does that then convert do those people then convert through into following their local mls side or maybe taking their children to the local mls side probably probably i think it is sort of happening and probably over time it will happen more and do their children then having grown up with a local mls club then view their allegiance primarily to their local mls club as opposed to um, uh, the Premier League club that, that, that their dad follows or whatever it might be. So I think that's one matter. There was a lot of talk about promotion relegation. Um, obviously, the MLS is a franchise-based system, which therefore has no promotion and relegation. There's then a separate entity called the USL, um, which has got three divisions and therefore, in theory, should have promotion and relegation, but currently does not they are debating very actively whether to bring promotion and relegation in. If they do, and surely they must, surely they must within that system, then it'll be quite interesting to compare a franchise league on the one hand against a promotion and relegation league on the other hand, because some of the USL clubs are quite sizable, uh, quite significant um, and in, in, inten- in attendance terms, not too different to some of the MLS clubs. So it'd be quite interesting to see what, what effect, if any, that would have both in terms of the USL market, but also whether it starts to eat into the MLS market. Is promotion and relegation as important as we think? If it is, then that could be a really interesting laboratory experiment.
Wow, yeah. That sounds fascinating. I was hoping when I was in D.C. recently to get down to see a Washington uh, D.C. game, but unfortunately their season had just ended and they'd failed to make the yeah. playoffs. So uh, I was denied that opportunity. One last thing, Charlie. It would be very remiss of us on one of these podcasts not to talk about cost controls. That's one of our hobby horses. But that came up as well at Soccer X then. The, the future of cost control and maybe what that means for academy development for European clubs. Yeah, it was obviously constantly talked about both on panels, but also in the sidelines of the conference, etc. cetera. Um, just comparing notes between different leagues on what moving to a percentage of revenue based system is going to look like and the implications of it. Um, and really the consensus getting away from whether people think it's a good thing or a bad thing. Everyone accepts it as being an inevitable thing. Um, the consensus was, though, that effectively the, there's an arms race now to see who can get their hands on as much young talent as possible um, because it's going to become very, very difficult within cost control mechanisms to pay the sums of money required to acquire talent at a more mature stage. Um, now, that has imp interesting implications for the transfer market, you know, probably going to see some deflation of the transfer market in time unless something strange happens. But what it does mean is that all the clubs there were thinking very, very hard about their academy systems and about feeder clubs and, and all this type of stuff. Now, these are things that lots of clubs have been sort of looking at for some time. Sort of, Some of them have got them within their multi-club models, sort of, etc. But it's definitely going to become a hot topic over the next couple, two to three years as these cost control mechanisms sink in and the reality of them sink in. And once it becomes clear that you can only afford so many senior players, expensive senior players, the quality of your academy is clearly going to become much more important. So there was a lot of talk about academy, um, how, how to improve academy performance. This is a big issue in the US, by the way, Adrian, just to conclude, which is that they just don't have the, uh, an equivalent setup to what we have in that their sports, American sports, you play through your high school, you then go to college and then you get drafted out of college into professional sport at the age of 2021, 20, right? So there, therefore the clubs, the NFL franchises don't have academies. They're drafting kids out of college. Um, that's, you, you can't have that system within football. You won't be competitive. If a young player go, plays high school soccer in as much as it exists, which it doesn't really, and then goes into university and plays university football, soccer, and then tries to get a professional contract at the age of 21, that's very, very rarely going to happen. They need to be in full-time academies by the age of 16 to be competitive with the European and Latin American super elite players, etc. So that's just one thing they've got. I mean, it quite astonished me to find out how much parents have to pay in order for their children to actually play soccer in the U.S., you know, it's an expensive middle class sport in the US. It's not like it is with us where there's a there's a football pitch, soccer pitch around every single corner. It's not like that. It's, it's, it's very different over there in the high schools. They play the American sports. And if you want your child to keep on playing European football past a certain age, you're going to be paying for that kid to be coached. And that obviously is a massive detrimental effect to large parts of the population. Indeed. And uh may skew the the profile the demographic profile of the of the youngsters who come through listen charlie we're going to talk about fifa and infantino i think in more detail on a future episode so let's park that for now and thank you what a fascinating insight into uh soccer x it's made your trip to miami worthwhile charlie i think you can say yeah so uh well done to you for taking on the onerous responsibility of a, <laughs> of a, of a trip to Sun Soap Florida. Thanks, thanks for the invite, but, you know, maybe <laughs> next time. Anyway, uh, genuinely uh, really good, good insight there from uh, Charlie Methven. I'm Adrian Goldberg. If you want to read more about this, I write about where's the money gone. I'm writing a book which is taking forever to complete, but you can get more details at adriangoldberg.substack.com. I've also switched to Blue Sky as well. Join the X Exodus. So you might get me at Adrian Goldberg 
www.bluesky.com. I think that's something many football clubs will be doing in the coming weeks and months as well. I know that the German football club, Sam Pauli, has quit X or Twitter. Is that something you've thought about, Charlie, at Charlton? Because there's been, I think, three million people signed up to Blue Sky in the last week. I will remain on X, by the way, for the time being, but many people are leaving it behind altogether, regarding it as some kind of... Uh, kind of politically dark place and a bit of a, a cesspit, but it's also been a fantastic tool of communication for many people over the years. And most clubs have a, a strong Twitter presence as well as TikTok and Instagram and so on. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we, we as an organisation are politically agnostic. We don't really believe that football mixes well with, with party politics. Um, we are on Twitter or X. And um, I spoke to our um, head of media and communications this week from, from Miami and he had opened up a Blue Sky um, channel. Um, it's quite straightforward to communicate down both channels to make sure that anyone who wants to be in contact with you can be, um, doesn't have to sort of, you know, doesn't have to be on X if they don't want to be on X. Um, so, you know, we, we go where the audience tells us to go. That we had a look at it and there are a small number, and by small I'm talking very small number of Charlton X followers who have um, come off X and one has to assume that they've joined Blue Sky, but it's obviously much harder to tell that. Um, so we, we need to be able to be in touch with those people, communicate with those people. So yes, yeah, that, 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 that's absolutely right. Yeah, Matt, it's the coming thing. Uh, you have been, you heard it here last. Uh, Charlie, thank you. Yes. <laughs> that as well. uh, thank you to uh, Jed Thomas for his production help with this episode and also to Mark Machado for his terrific work on the socials at 1129 Media. I'm Adrian Goldberg. This has been Where's the Money Gone? Do spread the word. If you're watching this on YouTube, by the way, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss an episode. And if you're listening via your favourite podcast platform, leave a review if you can, and also hit the subscribe button too. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening. Cheers now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.